Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Seth, and I am a cartoonist. There is something very lovely about the stillness of a comic book page. That austere stacked grid of boxes, the little people trapped in time. I actually think it is better suited for portraying the interior life of a person than the sort of big blown world of fantasy. I've been asked by the NFB to repeat questions as they're asked to me, or to phrase them as a statement. Um, why do I believe that comics are more suited to mundane reality than to fantasy? Uh, there's something about that very simple, understated nature of how comics are created with little bubbles that form in your brain. It may sound like a ridiculous statement, but in some ways cartooning is much like what the Impressionists were doing, in that you're not aiming for the detail so much as the overall feeling. Cartooning to me isn't really about drawing at all. It's about graphic design. It's about creating iconic images that you move around on the page which actually stimulate in the reader their own experience. They're like memory drawings, I call them. But that simple iconic drawing operates in many ways like language does. I can't draw the texture of the natural world. I can create a house and you can add the boards on it yourself the way it really is. I think something about that process of recreating the world in your mind through these memory drawings is what brings in the real world. In the last few years, I did a few autobiographical stories in my sketchbook. I have to come up with an expedient method to do it. And the simple answer seemed to me, I, I actually think it came to me while I was having a phone call with another cartoonist. And he was talking about the difficulty of trying to write a diary. And I said, jokingly, you should just get some rubber stamps and do it. And then I thought, I said immediately, actually, don't do that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, I have like a, a stamp of myself at my desk. I have one of walking. Just what is memory, I pondered. It's an odd thing, not a factual record. It is a flash of captured experience. Think of somewhere in a memory. You don't see the place so much as feel it. You can't look around and itemize what was in the room, but you sense the details around you. You feel the proximity of people and objects about you. It's almost a textural experience. A memory is like a photograph of a sensation. October 11th, 2005. Left the house today, errands. Wine, bakery, and the Italian market. Walking is the best time to reflect. Saw an old woman sitting on a bench. Just an old woman like any other. A little feeble, a little addled. It occurred to me that when mother had been out shopping, this is probably how she looked to others. My beloved mother, just another doddering old lady. The thought of this caused such a sudden rush of emotion that tears almost popped out of my eyes. I don't know how he does this, but he, he somehow, you know, made a day into, you know, 35 hours instead of 24 hours. And not only has he become extremely prolific as a cartoonist, but aside from doing all this work that he's known for, so well known for, I mean, he has all these other side projects and, you know, none of us can figure it out how he gets, how he gets any of this done. His progression over the years has been fantastic and his dedication to his art form um, is amazing as well. I mean, he's the type of guy that could easily, um, easily have given up comics, which uh, years ago, in favor of an illustration career or a fine art career for that matter. The generation of cartoonists I was working with were coming out of, uh, were benefiting from the work the underground cartoonists had done before us. They'd opened the door to the idea that comics could be art. My focus has always been on just doing uh, the, the comics panel to panel. Whereas he, he would be doing paintings and then he would want to create the frame for the painting and he would be doing these little handcrafted boxes and it would all be gorgeous. And I'd be like, yeah, why don't I want to do that sort of stuff? 
Our melodrama tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is entitled The Apology of Albert Batch. This evening, his life comes to its conclusion. As an artist, you should have work that isn't just to be published. And that's why I have all these little hobbies, as I call them. That's why I have my rubber stamp diary. That's why I have my sketchbook. That's why I have the City of Dominion. It's very different than working on a comic page where you know the minute you start it that you're planning to publish it. That's a straightforward artistic goal of trying to communicate with another person. There's something really valuable about doing art that's just for yourself. The Creek. I suspect many people have had a place like this in their childhood, a place where they encountered the natural world without the watchful eye of an adult a place that remains unnaturally vivid in the imagination. The creek was within easy walking distance, just beyond a new subdivision on the edge of town, a wild area of little streams in the shadow of the bush. Over a fence and into a grassy field, and in that field a pond, simply brimming with life. Dragonflies, painted turtles, water striders, whirligig beetles, and of course, frogs. Frogs in all stages of their lives. Always so startling to see them on the threshold of being that final creature. In the field, the milkweed, the cattail, and wheatgrass, Queen Anne's lace, the skunk cabbage, and in the bush, the trillium. The trillium held a special fascination. Being the provincial flower, we were forbidden to pick it. Schoolyard lore warned that if a trillium was picked, it would bleed red blood. I promised never to touch one. I purchased an old postcard of Strathroy, Ontario, postmarked 1909, the old swimming hole. Was this the same spot? Had we inherited it and its name? Was I just one of a long line of boys who played and swam there? I remember how unpleasant the creek bottom felt with just bare feet. The mud and the reeds and the crayfish skittering between your legs. I remember how it felt to be there when you were in a group and how different it felt to be there alone. When I returned as an adult in the 1990s, the creek was unchanged. It was eerily familiar. However, when last I visited, the bush had grown so thick, I couldn't even get near. Shit. One of the great things about being able to do a comic book any way you wanted it is that you could tell the story as slow as you liked and as long as you liked. And I wanted to capture some of the qualities that you would have in a reverie. And for that, you really need to have a slow pace. Somewhere on the prairies, at the edge of a little town, there is a closed-up drive-in theater. Closed 10 years. Next to that drive-in, you'll find a rusted-out kitty carousel that no child has touched since 1973. And on the shores of Lake Huron, there is a cottage. And in that cottage, there is a back room. And in that back room, there is an old cardboard box filled with road maps, insurance folders, appliance pamphlets, mimeographed recipes, and black and white snapshots. A box that has remained unopened in 35 years. Further on, down a gravel road near Algonquin, stands the nailed up information booth of an out of business tourist camp. Inside, under its main counter is a dusty book open to page 126. This is where it has sat since the door closed for good. 
since it was absent-mindedly left behind, half read. In these places, and others like them, time is standing still. Nostalgia implies a kind of uh, hallmark card sentiment, that there is a golden past that you're yearning for. And there's lots of yearning in my work, but I don't think of it as being that kind of nostalgia. In fact, I always think the stories I'm writing, to flatter myself, are more complicated about the past than that. My characters, I'm not presenting people who lived in some golden past. I tend to like to write about people whose lives have been, there's some complexity about whether or not their life was a success or not. Albert Batch was a well-known Canadian cartoonist from the 20th century. Trout Haven was quite a gentle comic strip, a sort of bucolic actually, all about the little events in a small village. He had 10 collections of his famous comic strip published during his lifetime. They were published by the Narwhal Press of Dominion, Ontario. They sold very well. Graphic novel, what a horrible term. A misshapen thing stitched together from two words, which I must assume are considered more respectable sounding than comic and book combined. People recognize the phrase graphic novel and I now find myself saying it in interviews simply because it is easier to use than to try and institute some new name of my own invention. That's hard work to rename something and make it stick. I did that once years ago when I changed my name from Gregory Gallant to Seth. That was a big chore. First, introducing the new name and then enforcing its use. Correcting friends or family every time they used the old name. Reinforcing it constantly until it became second nature for everyone. That's a young man's game. I don't have the stomach for that sort of highly disciplined assholeism any longer. <laughs> and that was kind of part of the process of being involved in the punk scene in the early 80s and looking for a pretentious, scary name, you know. And so that's why I picked Seth. I, I actually had a last name back then too, which I'll never tell. Uh, oh. oh no. I'd show you my tattoo before I tell you that. routine and my days are pretty structured. I get up early in the morning because my wife Tanya is a barber and when she goes off to work I generally come down to the studio. I begin with some work that I've left from the night before. The rest of the morning I like to work on one of my private projects. Time to eat, time to read. If there's any commercial work to be done at that point, any specific jobs that have a deadline, that's usually I work on that in the afternoon. Dealing with the daily problems of business, checking the email, making phone calls, make dinner. Tanya arrives home, we have dinner, spend some time together, have a glass of wine, relax. Being a 50-year-old man, I go and take a nap. The evening, best time for working on the comics, I find. I'll work till about 11 o'clock at night. If it's a little busier, I might work till 11.30 or 12. And then I come upstairs and Tanya and I will usually sit down, I'll drink a couple of glasses of wine, we'll watch a movie. And then it's reading time and then to bed by one o'clock. Actually 1.30, always 1.30. Next day, exactly the same thing. I'm a pretty extroverted person, but uh, and I think probably you're more naturally introverted, and yet uh, you've got the career with people, and I've got the career where I'm alone. But it works for, good for us that way. 
you have that interior world that, that you let me peek into once in a while, and, and I find that fascinating. That's why I like to leave them alone. There's some Protestant work ethic in the back of my brain that makes me feel good when I work. Like if I have a day where I get five things done, work in my sketchbook, do my diary, get some part of some commercial job, work on my comic, and work on one of my little buildings. A day like that, there is such a good feeling to that. You want that feeling when you go to bed every night that you've accomplished something. You know, when I wanted to be a cartoonist in my 20s, uh, you know, I thought it would be cool. Um, I, what I wasn't thinking was crafting a life for myself where I'd spend all my time alone as a 50-year-old man in the basement, but that's uh, where it ended up, and that is where I'm happiest. I like that feeling of being by myself most of the time, but the comfortable feeling of being by myself, uh, where loneliness is removed by, uh, by Tanya. <laughs> Hearing Tanya laughing upstairs when I'm working, not knowing what she's laughing about. I know she wouldn't be insulted by this because we've talked about it before, but it's turned out that it's the same feeling I had with my own mother when I was in my room, working away, hearing her in the other part of the house. This supplied some need to me that removed loneliness. This is a book I put together a few years ago. It's titled The History of the Cosmic Comics Company which is kind of a deliberately grand title for what really is a, just a collection of what survives of the comic strips I drew when I was a child. One of the great powers of comics when you're a child is that there is a range of intense emotions you can have from reading these, from the genuine uh, excitement of genre pulp adventure, people fighting each other, of course, but also these feelings of coming to deeper understanding of life. You, when you see a character like Superman facing death and you're a little kid, it's like a kind of childish profundity that you relate to. And so when I made up the uh, Keokuk story, uh, I wanted it to have that same quality. I drew many, many hundreds of pages of comic books, maybe the thousand pages of comic books from when I was a little kid until I went to art school and I never showed them, maybe once or twice showed something to some other kids. Um, it was a totally private little world and Mother really was the main person I showed anything to and her support was really very important. Coming home from kindergarten, I stand for a moment in the driveway. I wet my cheeks with spit and dash in the house, pretending to cry. Mom! An act contrived purely to get affection Mom, from Mother. They were mean to me. <laughs> Was I that starved for love? Oh, you poor thing. I guess I was. Let's get you a cup of tea. Looking back, I can't recall ever being held as a child. Thanks, Mom. And foolishly, it was around this time when I stopped kissing Mother goodnight. Night-night. I had decided I was a big boy, and a goodnight kiss was for babies. I didn't regret my decision immediately, but in time, I saw it as an irreversible mistake. I longed to kiss her again, but couldn't go back on it. Mom, I'm bored. Go do your drawings. I never stopped regretting it right into my teens. I would daily resolve to kiss her. Tomorrow, for sure. But I never did. In fact, I didn't kiss her again until I was a grown man. I'm heading home now, mother. I always think of memory as being uh, it's like a blueprint of a sensation somehow that you have in your brain. And this, this blueprint has to be studied when you go back to look at it. And much like composing a panel, it's like you're in the center of that blueprint, the center of the memory, and you go, here I am, I'm eight years old, I'm in the backyard, There's the, the brick of the house is over here. Or you start to build the memory in your brain much the way you might move around little toy figures or something in, in a diorama.
For a time, we lived in a small house on Milner Street. In my tiny bedroom, on top of a dresser, I kept my stuffed animals, my best loved toys. A bland assortment of cheap stuffed animals, haphazardly acquired. At least two of them carnival prizes. Their faces remembered better than any childhood friend, recalled clearer than any teacher from that time. Several years later, I had a large dresser. I kept one drawer for models which had fallen from favor. They'd be demoted from shelf to drawer. Each time I opened or closed the drawer, something would break. The damage only got worse as I crammed more and more models in there. Eventually, the drawer was filled only with small, shattered pieces. My father grew up in the Depression in Prince Edward Island, and he'd always told me the stories um, when I was a child about his childhood. I thought of them as good stories, like stories I like to listen to, even though that they were stories about being poor and having to steal food and parental neglect. I wanted to record them somehow. So I just asked him to write them down. Sometimes it's funny, I'll look back at photographs of places we went together where I would snap pictures. They're the same kind of places I would go to now. And these things are still imprinted in my brain somehow. Transistor radio. In grade five, we moved to Elmwood Street, though we lived there only about a year. The scene of so many terrible fights between my parents. They were always fighting. Or I should say, he was. Mother and I were terrorized by my father's temper. It's strange how horrible the sound of an adult's anger is to a child. I often tried to block it out. At night, if he were shouting, I would play my transistor radio. An earphone in one ear, and a finger in the other. It never worked. That sort of thing just can't be ignored. I think I was brought up with that feeling of fear of his temper, which was the temper of a frustrated person, a person who felt like they'd missed out on certain opportunities. He never felt he got to do what he wanted to do in life. I think he was always kind of hoping something would happen. I don't know what it was. When I think of Seth, uh, sometimes I think of uh, Marcel Proust. You have a dozen memories of childhood, and you go over them in your mind so much and covet them so much that you polish them. Well, memory is funny, too. Who knows why you remember anything? Things take on significance as time goes on. I sometimes wonder, like, how much control you even have over what you pick to remember as significant. One bright day, I went up to the attic. I gathered up my beloved stuffed toys from Milner Street. I carried them out into the backyard and carefully hung them one by one from a tree. I went back inside and got my pellet gun. I laid down, I carefully took aim, and shot them all to pieces. I felt nothing special in doing it. It wasn't a meaningful act, just something to pass the time. But looking back, I can think of no more fitting event to signify the end of childhood. I was not a happy teenager, and when I came from the little town to the big city, this was my opportunity to uh, become a new person. It took me about a year and a half maybe to reach the point where Seth was born. If you do anything long enough, it becomes real. I mean, good advice is be the person you want to be. 
because you'll start out faking, but eventually you'll be that person. On Tuesday night, I went for a late night stroll. It was a beautiful night, a bit of a chill in the air. Not really cold though. Still, winter was coming. Believe it or not, in this small town, I could actually see the stars. I walked down London Street, lost in thought. My mind was fixated on a girl I was disastrously pursuing in another city. I stopped for a moment, and as I stood there, I heard an almost imperceptible, tinny sound. It was music. I recognized the song. I quickly realized that it was coming from a garbage bag on the curb. Someone had obviously thrown out one of those cards with a computer chip in it. Alone, in the darkness, this seemed deeply funny and profoundly sad. His personal approach to his work and taking everything he does so seriously, although with a sense of humor, it definitely made me think of my work in a different way. I was a big fan of Chester's comic books uh, when I was living in Montreal. Seth was always with Chester. The minute the three of us started hanging around together, the, the friendship worked, and we all spoke the same language. This one? Yes. Did you play I the jack? Played, I played, I played the, the jack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're irritated by qualities of, that you see in me that are actually of yourself or something. I don't buy that theory. No, theory. Seth, Chester Brown, and Joe Matt were called the Toronto Three. They were just always together. They all, they always came and got together. And at one point or another, they all did autobiographical comics. So naturally they would draw their friends and their friends happened to be each other. I don't know if you've read this, but you see that it's like the two of them against me. <laughs> this is true. The book. This is true. I'm not denying that. Seth probably does feel superior to a lot of people, but he also, you know, has a built-in, you know, humility. And I think, you know, our artists in general are probably like this. To make you commit something to paper or film, you've got to, like, have that arrogance that whatever you're going to say is worth taking up people's time to be said. That writing about yourself was a double-edged sword. Um, yes, you could get at the real things, but you became overly aware of how you were choosing to portray yourself. And that's why in Good Life, even though I'm the main character, it was fiction, and I felt free to no longer worry about it. Seth has always liked mixing fiction and fact together. Everybody who works with fiction does that. But Seth really wants to blur the lines between the two. He does want us to question what's real and what isn't. That interior experience is so hard to get outside of the shell of the human body. Um, that's where the comics are, like an important way to try to communicate that. 14 hours ago, Albert Batch put down his pencil and took to his bed. Here he has remained, drifting in and out of consciousness. He recalls the faces of the people he's known. He thinks of the places he's seen. What did any of it mean? In this moment, he realizes that this is what his work should have been about. The idea is so vivid that Albert almost rises up to go back to the drawing table, but he doesn't. We hear the death rattle. The Invisible Life. Perhaps it had been a mistake moving to a town where I didn't know a single soul. By December, though, I had become pretty used to spending almost every waking moment alone in my studio. When that became unbearable, I'd read a book or listen to a record. No one ever spoke to me. And as the months passed, I began to imagine that I was living an invisible life. Often I'd go for a walk and then eat lunch at a nearby restaurant. Egg salad, please. At times, it seemed grim. 
On the way to that restaurant, there was a large vacant lot, surrounded, for some odd reason, with big concrete blocks. In my silence, this empty space began to take on a solemn quality, a sort of charged presence. On one sad, lonely morning, I found myself speaking aloud as I walked through it. Good God, give me some happiness. The perfect spot for an atheist prayer, knowing full well that no supreme being was listening or looking out for me. Still, a few weeks later, when I first saw her sweet face, I couldn't help but wonder. Hi. Well, um, we met in art class, um, but I don't draw and I don't teach. I'm a model. I didn't come up and talk to you. You don't, as the, one of the artists, you don't walk up and start talking to the nude model in a life drawing class. That's just uh, inappropriate. So you came up and talked to me, which mm -hmm. was nice. And within a couple of months, we were married. So it was really, you know, surprising turn of events. Uh, we're both into persona building. Uh, that's part of the appeal of design and fashion and art. He's always got a dream world, and, and that's who he is. My interest in the aesthetics in the past is like clearly predicated on the fact that I live here in this world as it is now. The marquee, yeah, I, I love it. It's, it's so beautiful. It's uh, certainly a Guelph landmark. Even the house, it's like I'm not trying to transform that house back into like 1920. It's more of an art project than it is like a, a historical project. I'm just trying to make the world, make it the world I want to live in. The fact that it says nothing lasts on that is what they used to call, I believe, a memento mori, to remind everyone that kings and paupers were all gonna die. The Middle Ages were, were great for uh, bringing you down, but um, nothing does last. Everything is transient. And even though I say that, uh, we still, you know, like all romantic couples, you still say like, you know, I hope I see you in the afterlife. There's still always that, like, somewhere in the back of the mind that you don't really want anything to end. Mm -hmm. A year or so after Albert's death, an oddball fan approached psychics to see if they could communicate with the cartoonist. Apparently, Albert had found his way to some otherworldly cartoonist Valhalla. George Harriman was there, Charles Schultz, Doug Wright, and Peter Arno. Robert Crumb as well. This casts some doubt on the validity of Madame Flotsky's vision, since Crumb is still very much alive at present. You can certainly have all the self-doubts in the world, but that's why an artist has to make like a leap of faith. And so when you have that book in your hands, it's this feeling that my, this is what my life is about, that my life has meaning. And since I do feel that, I wanted to pass that experience on to my father. I wanted to be able for him to have a book of his life, that he could hold it in his hands and say, I wasn't just here ephemerally, I've left a record behind. There you disturb my comfort. State your business and get out. I told him my problem. He told me he had no money for the poor and opened the door for me to leave. As soon as you got an apple from the old lady next door, you had a bunch of friends. Oh, oh Johnny, Johnny, yes? <laughs> Can I have the core? Well, okay, wait till I get to it then. Finally, another little guy. Can I have the seeds? Seeds are no good to eat. I like them. <laughs> That's how bad it was. But when the book came out and I sent it to him, I didn't really get much of a response initially. And I remember thinking, well, that's a little disappointing. I thought, uh, maybe it just doesn't mean as much to him to have a book out as it means to me. But then, you know, about a year, maybe a year and a half later, I was out visiting him and he, you know, he said some things to me and we had like a moment together where I could see that it had been a very meaningful experience to him. He knew I had a complicated childhood with him and he knew that as a teenager we had our problems too, but I think that that was that realization that there was a real depth of connection. And, um, and that was very touching to me uh, because... Um, it's, you know, it's very hard to tell anyone else that, um, to like impart the depth of uh, feeling you have for someone like that, for your mother or your father. Mm -hmm. 
I step out for a late night smoke. A beautiful night, cool and clear. I amble up towards Mother's Stone, a kind of memorial I've installed to her in a corner of the yard. Where are you now, Mother? And naturally, I look up. A large full moon in the sky and a single star, as if in its orbit. For such a clear night, I can't see another star. It seems pretty obvious symbolism. The female moon, mother, and I, the circling star. When your mother dies, there's a real feeling that like some real connection to the world is gone. Like many stiff upper lip kind of Brits, she, she had kept her pain to herself all her life. And even to the end, she did that to a big degree. Um, she, but you could see that there was genuine fear and um, sadness in her. And that was really painful to see. And it was also really painful to know that she had forgotten everything about me. Um, to feel like such a close connection to someone and to know they don't remember any of your childhood anymore and maybe they don't even remember you. All my work is created from that sense of loss. I feel a strong sense that the baseline to human experience is sadness. Um, it doesn't feel too sad like that this moment is passing away. Um, and that's no comment. <laughs> that's, that's no, that's no uh, slight towards you. I just mean this particular moment it's fresh, so when it passes, it's like, it's, you know, it's just a few minutes. But, you know, in a year, this whole experience of being here will be completely beyond my grasp. There will just be bits and pieces of it left. That whole process of constantly losing everything, and as you get older, um, places vanish into the past. They're not even existing in the world anymore. People you loved end up being just in the past. I think that whole experience of being trapped in the present while everything is constantly moving into the past creates a, a deep feeling of sadness in me. And I think all my work is about that. So even though that city, I did not create it specifically with that in mind, that is like an underlying force behind its creation. I guess to recapture some of the pleasures of, of building things as a child, I started building these buildings as I started figuring out the history of this town. The town itself is uh, an imaginary town set in Northern Ontario. What you see here really is just the tip of the iceberg of the amount of imaginative thought I'm going to have to put into constructing the history of the city. Uh, originally the purpose was for this possible graphic novel. As the city has grown in complexity and the history has grown more interesting to me, in some levels, I think I'm just enjoying making it up and going through it. I'm not sure what the actual purpose is. The Ott Typewriter Building. The North Star Restaurant. There's probably about 40 or 50 buildings here at the moment. This will probably double at some point to at least 100. I'll probably stop building them when I run out of space in the basement. <laughs> 1949, I was correct. It was the 85th anniversary of the founding of the town. Each parade is opened with a large figure of their founder, J. Morgan Smith, in his coffin. The parade always ends with a large live figure of him carrying the key to the city. So it's got a bit of that death and rebirth kind of imagery to it as well. I realized that with a city of roughly 300,000, which is what I imagine, 
that means I have like an infinite amount of material to work with, that I could be thinking about this until I, until I die. Remarkable weather today. It started out light in the morning, but quickly got heavier. By mid-afternoon, the town felt snowbound. I spent the day down in the studio, wrapped in a wonderful feeling of isolation. By evening, I had to come up and take a look. The accumulation was breathtaking, literally several feet of new snow. fresh, glittering blanket of pearl. It's hard to imagine any concept of heaven that could be more beautiful than this world. there's one thing I can take away from this experience, it's that I will never do another documentary in the rest of my life.